Hey friends, welcome. Beth Davis and I were just having a little technical glitch there, but it's no problem at all. It doesn't matter in the big scheme of things, does it? Welcome to all of you. I'm so delighted that you're here. Here we are together. Holy Saturday. This is this day of waiting, this in-between, and what a perfect day to be waiting here together, to be in a place that we never thought we'd be, to be surrounded by grief, to be wondering what God is up to, what God is going to do next. Maybe in some way we've never been closer to those disciples who were waiting, who were grieving, who wondered what God was up to. So here we are together on Holy Saturday. So as we're all getting settled, would you join me in prayer as we just wait together in this space, this beautiful holy waiting of Holy Saturday? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of goodness, we gather together today, we gather in ways that we never expected. And yet across the miles, across the continents, we are gathered in prayer as one church, as one body of Christ today. God, come to each of our hearts on this holiest of Saturdays as we prepare for the goodness and the glory that you have waiting for us tomorrow. Help us to see the goodness of where you are right now in our lives, that you are here too among us. Open our hearts to this time and space that we can join together and reflect and pray and fill this church room with graces that we never expected. Help our hearts to be open to you, Lord. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, if you're wondering who is in your Facebook feed right now, let me tell you. So my name is Laura Kelly Finucci. I'm one of the Blessed Is She team writers. And I was one of the writers that contributed to this year's Lent book, Here Too. This book is so near and dear to my heart. I got the idea for this book years ago and thinking about how is God here too in all the times and spaces of our life? How does God show up in ways we don't expect. And so many writers contributed their beautiful stories and insights to this book. I hope that this was a gift to your Lenten journey. We're gonna pick up on this theme today a little bit here too. So I'm coming to you live today from Minnesota where I live with my husband and five boys uh, who are all banished outside this room right now. But it's a real gift to be here with you. I just love to reflect on scripture and where God is in our lives. That's just at the heart of my writing. So it's such a gift to be part of the Blessed Is She team that gets to do that for you every day. So what we're gonna do here today in our first Easter gathering, even though we're still on the cusp of Easter. We, we need some extra Easter hope this year, don't we? We're going to actually look back over the weeks of Lent that we went through in here too. Now, if you don't have the book, that's totally fine. But what I'm going to do for you today is go back through each of the week's themes, each of those places and times where we meet God. And I'm going to share with you a story from the Old Testament about a woman in scripture who met God in that same kind of place. So here we had stories from the gospel, right? And we journeyed through those stories in the gospel and times in our own lives where we met God, you know, in the desert, on the road, on the mountaintop, in the storms, in the garden, and near the tomb. So all of those places where we may have met God in our own lives where we've met God in scripture, I'm gonna jump us back to the Old Testament and share some stories of women that I just love, just soul sisters to my heart, who can show us how to keep looking for God in our own lives as we enter into these sacred mysteries and the Easter season that's waiting for us. So I want us to each be thinking about how do the stories of the women that we'll be sitting with today, how do they teach us about ways to look for God in our own lives. I think that's the invitation to us today. So that's the question I hope you'll keep on your heart. What is this what is this woman's story teach me about my own experiences of God and where God is waiting to meet me in my own life today? You know, as I was getting ready for today, I was thinking back as I was saying, this is probably a year to hold some of those favorite Holy Week liturgies in our hearts since we're not gathered physically as a church. And I was thinking back to this beautiful Easter vigil way up on the North Shore of Minnesota. My husband and I were up at his family cabin and we, we went to this church that we didn't really know, but that was going to be kind of our home for Triduum that year. 
And when we gathered all outside for the Easter vigil that night, I'll never forget that before the priest started the mass, he said to the whole crowd that was gathered there, kind of shivering because it's Easter in Minnesota, um, we we're all gathered around the fire. And he said, this is our night for telling stories. And this hush fell over the crowd. And you could just, you could almost feel the hair raised on everyone's arm because this is our night for telling stories. You know, on, at the Easter Vigil, we revisit all those beautiful stories of salvation history, right? We go back, we get, it's like the best of, we get to read all of these gorgeous stories about where God is in our lives. Um, and it's, this is our night for telling stories. So what a beautiful day, I thought, to really soak in the stories of our faith, to sit with these stories of the sisters of our faith and to tell these stories again of, of where God is working in our lives. So I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to take you through each of those times and places that we journeyed through, through Lent. Um, I'm going to give you the scripture passage of the story that we're talking about. So feel free to jot that down. Maybe it's a new story to you, or maybe it's one that you think, I really want to come back to that and sit with her story later. So don't worry, I'm going to go ahead and give you all those scripture passages as we go along so you can go back and, and sit with those. Um, but let's just dive right in, shall we? So we started Lent this year in our book here too, in the desert. That was the place that we took up first in the desert, right? Right there with Jesus. So the woman that of course came to mind when I was thinking about the desert is Hagar. And she's not a, a woman in scripture that we necessarily hear about a lot. So her story might be new to you. And if it is, I'll tell you, go to Genesis 16 is where her story starts. Um, but Hagar was the handmaid of Sarah. If you remember, Sarah and Abraham weren't able to have children, right, for a long time. And so Hagar was Sarah's handmaid that she had given to Abraham, as was the custom of their time, so that Hagar could bear him a child. Well, understandably, there was a lot of jealousy between Sarah and Hagar. And at this point in, in the book of Genesis, um, Sarah actually had sent Hagar off into the wilderness, just banished her, just sent her off into the desert, could care less what happened to her. And obviously this was devastating for Hagar, right? She thought she was being sent to die. And instead this incredible thing happens. I'm gonna read to you from the scripture from Genesis 16. The angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord, which by the way, is a phrase that we use for God's presence in the Old Testament. So the angel of the Lord said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, now you have conceived and shall bear a son and you shall call him Ishmael for the, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And so Sarah named the Lord who, so Hagar named the Lord who spoke to her, you are El Roy. For she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? That story of how Hagar encountered God in the wilderness is just an incredible, Incredible story, I think, for us to reflect on, to think about the, the desert times in our life, the time that we felt far away from God or a really dry season of prayer in our lives. Um, so what does Hagar's story tell us about how we encounter God? I think first and foremost, she reminds us that we're not abandoned. You know, here she is in the wilderness, in the desert, and yet God comes right to her. And it's the same for us. God will find us wherever we are. We are never abandoned. Second, I think it's so powerful that Hagar is actually, you might not know this, she's the first person in the Bible to name God. Think how incredible that is. This woman who is out in the wilderness, who's away from all of society, right? Everything that she knows. She is the first person who gets to name God with this title that she gives God. And I think it's a reminder for all of us that we're called into relationship with the Lord and that we may encounter God in really powerful ways, even in the desert, in, in very surprising ways. And third, I think Hagar's story reminds us that the wilderness is never a place that we have to stay. 
you know, in scripture, God calls people into the wilderness. God called, you know, the Holy Spirit sent Jesus into the desert, right? But it's never a place we're sent to stay. It's always a place to move through. And so too, I think when you think about those desert times in your own life, to remember that God wants to lead you out of that. It may be a long desert. It may be an incredibly hard time in the wilderness, but God's plan is to lead you out of that. And I think Hagar reminds us of that in a beautiful way. So take her story with you today, especially if you're in a desert time. And I think many of us are, are feeling that, you know, feeling like we may be out in the wilderness here. We're not with our people. We're not with our church in the same way. And yet, you know, God is waiting to find us here too. And I think Hagar reminds us of that. Okay, so in the second week of Lent in our Here To book, we thought about home. How does God find us at home? That home theme was the, the theme that we took for that week. So interestingly, the woman that I thought about for this week's theme was Sarah. So we started with Hagar, now we're gonna move back to Sarah. Um, Sarah's probably a little more familiar to many of us, right? In being Abraham's wife. Um, and, and if you wanna reflect more on her story, the, the scripture that I'm gonna share a little bit from today is in Genesis 18. So go ahead and check out Genesis 18 for more about Sarah's story. But the story I wanna share with you today is one that I bet we've all heard at some point, this beautiful story about God literally showing up at Abraham and Sarah's home. And, um, but I invite you to think about this in new ways today as I read it. Think about how ordinary this scene is. You know, what would it be like if the Lord just showed up at your door right now um, and, and was welcomed into your home? Think about your own home, wherever you are today. Um, imagine what it would be like to have this happen in your life, okay? So from Genesis 18, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to find them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he'd prepared, and he set it before them and stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I shall surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? In the set time, I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. Thinking about Sarah's story, I think that she teaches us a lot about what it means to encounter God at home. First of all, what a great reminder that God meets us in the ordinary. You know, I mean, here she is literally baking cakes for the angel of the Lord, right? The presence of these three mysterious strangers that have come to visit them. God's waiting to show up in our very ordinary lives too. Second, I think this story reminds us that welcoming the stranger can bring unexpected encounters with God. And I would guess, even if you think about your life at home, there are times that welcoming strangers into your home or into your heart brings a surprising encounter with God. And that I think is the third truth that Sarah's story reminds us, you know, and here she is laughing when she hears this astonishing news, because God is waiting to surprise us. Whether it's, you know, out in the wilderness or in our very own homes, God is waiting to do something wonderful and to surprise us. And what a great story of hope, I think, to carry with us into Easter to think about Sarah's story. Okay, so then in our third week of Easter, we went on the road, thinking about how do we encounter God on the road? Well, for this theme, for the road, I can't help but, but bring up one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament, which is Ruth, and thinking about how Ruth found God 
on the road. So if you want more on this story, you can go to Ruth, the first chapter of Ruth. Although I, I tell you, really, Ruth is such a short little book. It's only four chapters. It's such a gem. Just sit down and read the whole thing. It's a beautiful story if you haven't ever read the whole thing. Um, but in the story of Ruth, you know, her mother-in-law, Naomi, um, lost her husband. And then both of Naomi's, excuse me, Naomi's sons died. So Ruth herself is without a husband. And here are these women who have lost their husbands, you know, have lost their livelihood because their husbands were supporting them. They really have no place or status in their society anymore. So Naomi had decided she's gonna go back to her homeland um, from the place that she's been living. So in Ruth one, Naomi had set out from the place that she was living and she went with her two daughters-in-law. They were going back to the land of Judah. And then Naomi gets really honest with them. She says to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of her husband. Then Naomi kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? It has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. And they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more. I love the picture of these two women, these beautiful, strong women of faith on the road together, literally on the road, having this conversation about whether, you know, Ruth and Orpah should go back or whether they should go on. And Ruth is just determined she is going to stay on this road with Naomi. And I think that Ruth's story has a lot to teach us about our own encounters with God on the road. You know, first that God meets us through others. Naomi is just despondent at that time, right? She feels like she's lost everything. And yet Ruth speaks to her with such powerful words of love that I can't help but think, you know, Naomi felt God's presence through that. And so to remember that God shows up on the road in our daily lives through other people in really powerful ways. Second, I think Ruth's story reminds us that we're never abandoned by God even in our suffering, even when we feel bitter that we that we think God has abandoned us, the truth of God's love is that God is never far from us. So I think Ruth and Naomi's story teaches us that in a profound way that sometimes, you know, we need other people to remind us of the truth of God's love. And third, I think Ruth's story reminds us about faithfulness, that God is found in faithfulness. So the ways that you are faithful to people in your own life, the people that you have loved faithfully, that you've stuck by, that's a place where, you know, it's a holy place of encounter to be faithful to one another in love. So to remember that God shows up on that way too. Um, all those beautiful ways that I think God speaks to us through that story of Ruth and being on the road. So we went in the desert uh, at home on the road. and then. In that third week in Lent, because we kind of started with that uh, Ash Wednesday week, that was the first one. So the next week in Lent in here too, we talked about the storms. And I know this was a really powerful week for a lot of us to think about the storms in our life. How does God meet us in the storms? And when I was thinking about a woman from the Old Testament whose story speaks to us about the storms, Hannah was the one that came to mind right away. And Hannah's story is one I've loved for a long time. Um, when my husband and I were first married, we were going through infertility. And that story of faith, of Hannah's faith in, the, in facing the infertility that she had in her life um, gave me so much hope and so much strength in that season, in that time and place, that storm really in my life. So I wanted to put Hannah's story before our eyes today. Um, and Hannah's story is found in one Samuel. So in the first book of Samuel, right at the beginning, if you want to go and check out her story. Um, but, you know, Hannah's husband, again, as was the custom of the time, had two wives. And one of the wives was able to have many children. Hannah had none. 
And so every year when they would go up to, you know, pray in the house of the Lord, she would just weep at how she felt like God had forsaken her. And this caused her husband great pain because he loved her. Um, and so the story that comes to us uh, from the first book of Samuel comes when again, they have gone up to pray in this holy site. Um, and Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now, Eli, the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple. And Hannah was bitterly, bitterly distressed and prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She made this vow. O oh, Lord of hosts, if you will only look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, the priest, observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel, grant the petition you've made to him. And Hannah said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then she went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband and her countenance, her face was sad no longer. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. I love that story of faith in the midst of a storm, right? Hannah is a woman of incredible faith. And when we think about our own encounters with God in the storms in our life, first and foremost, I think she teaches us to be unafraid to pour out our hearts to God. You know, no matter what other people think of us, to be unafraid to bring all of us and all of our struggles, all of those storms before the Lord. God is ready and, and wants to know all of that from our heart. So I love that example of her prayer and just pouring out all her heart to the Lord. Second, I think Hannah's story reminds us that storms often last much longer than we would like. You know, before this story happens, there have been years and years and years where she watched this other woman have all these children and she had none. And that storm lasted a long time for her. And yet God was still faithful to her through that. So what a great reminder for us that no matter how long the storms of our life go on and rage around us, God is still there through the storm and still waiting to meet us right there in the storm. And third, what I love about the peaceful ending of that story is that reminder that peace always comes after the storm, right? Like that's nature's way, that there's always that calm after a storm, but it's also God's way. So if you think back on the storms in your own life, try to look for where have there been maybe those moments of calm and peace after the storm, or maybe right in the eye of the storm, right? To think about where God has met you in those times and places in your life too, even in the storms and the struggles. So moving on from the storm, the next place that we went in thinking about where we meet God was on the mountaintop. So thinking about those mountaintop moments in our life, right? Those big, beautiful moments, whether we have some insight about God or just this moment of deep closeness. And when I was thinking about a woman from the Old Testament who had a real mountaintop moment, I thought about Judith. Now, Judith's got her, her own book too. So go to the book of Judith. And I'm going to share a little bit from Judith 15 here. But if you don't know about her, you might have seen those paintings. She's the one that beheaded the wicked general. So there's some pretty gory paintings back in the Renaissance of Judith holding the head of this general. Um, but she saved her town. She led her people um, to safety through those through that action. And so at this point um, in Judith 15, she's leading the people in great praise at this victory, at their salvation. And in Judith 15, it says, the high priest and the elders of the Israelites who lived in Jerusalem came to witness the good things that the Lord had done for Israel and to see Judith and to wish her well. When they met her, they all blessed her with one accord and said to her, you are the glory of Jerusalem. You are the great boast of Israel. You are the great pride of our nation. 
You have done all this with your own hand. You have done great good to Israel and God is well pleased with it. May the almighty Lord bless you forever. And all the people said, amen. And all the women of Israel gathered to see Judith and blessed her. And some of them danced in her honor. She went before all the people in the dance, leading all the women while all the men of Israel followed, bearing their arms and wearing garlands and singing hymns. She began this Thanksgiving before all of Israel and all the people loudly sang this song of praise. And then it goes on to this beautiful song of praise that we get from Judith about, I will sing to my God a new song. You know, Lord, you are great and glorious, wonderful in strength, invincible. I just love this picture of Judith leading this great dance, this mountaintop moment, right? What joy and what incredible praise they were able to give to God in that moment. So if you think back, now probably not all of us have, you know, slain the evil general and <laughs> led our people to victory, but think about those great moments of joy in your life when you couldn't help but sing out praise to God, right? Where you wanted to share that with others, where you just felt like you were on that incredible mountaintop of closeness to God. And Judah's story, I think, reminds us that whenever we've experienced closeness with God or we want to praise God, that it's even more magnified if we share that with others, right? She led all of those, all the people of Israel in this great song of thanksgiving and praise. So I think she reminds us to share that joy with others when we feel close to God. Also, I think Judith reminds us to be unafraid to celebrate the high points of life, right? That, that those moments of, of glory and celebration, they keep us going through the low points, through the valleys of our life. And I don't know about you, but especially in the time where we are right now, I think we've got to celebrate what is good. I mean, even the small moments of victory in the day, right? The small goodness to be able to share those with a friend, you know, even over text or to, to call up, you know, a family member and be able to share a few things that are going well right now. That's such a gift to each other. We really can still meet each other in those moments of praise. So Judith reminds us, I think, to be unafraid to celebrate the small victories and the big ones to keep us going through the valleys, right? And finally, I think she reminds us that even though the mountaintop moments of our life might be few and far between. They're what sustain us, right? The memory of those moments of closeness to God sustain us. And again, for right now, you know, when we're celebrating a triduum that looks really different from years past, what a beautiful time to remember the mountaintop moments of Holy Week's past. You know, when, when were there beautiful moments of prayer or closeness to God or, you know, deep moments of connection that you felt in one of those Triduum liturgies. This is a year to feast on those in our memory, to hold those close and maybe to share those with others. And I think Judith really calls us to do that in a special way. So as we're getting closer to the end of Lent in here too, um, the, the theme that we were taking up next was the garden, thinking about how to meet God in the garden. And what a beautiful theme, you know, as, as we think about Jesus in the garden this week in Gethsemane, to think about where were the garden moments in our life where we've really met God in that intimate place of prayer. Um, not surprisingly, the woman that came to mind when I was thinking about the Old Testament and the garden was Eve, right? And if you think about the story of Eve, if you want, I'm going to share a little bit from Genesis 3. But you think about the closeness that Eve and Adam had with God in the garden. And um, what I think is so beautiful, even in that moment where, you know, Eve has disobeyed God, has eaten of the fruit of the tree that she was not supposed to eat of. There's this beautiful moment in Genesis 3 where Adam and Eve, the woman and the man, um, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. I just love that. Think of all the walks we're all taking now, right? Here's God just out enjoying the garden, enjoying what he's created. But the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. 
And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. So at, at, the, at once, I think it's a moment of great intimacy with God in the garden, right? Um, to think of the ways that that Eve and Adam and God would have enjoyed that garden together, just in beautiful, simple ways. And yet by the time we hear that story, there's already been that, that moment of sin. And I think that Eve's story reminds us that, you know, God loves and delights and longs to enjoy the garden with us, to enjoy creation, right? It's a place of intimacy. And you imagine what would it have been like to walk with God in the garden? Um, that that's truly the longing of God's heart is just to enjoy the goodness of creation with us. And yet I think Eve's story also reminds us that, you know, God loves us and forgives us and cares for us even when we sin. Right after, you know, this conversation that Adam and Eve are having with God, when God does send them out of the garden, I think it's this beautiful moment that God sows them clothes, you know, these, these animal hinds that, that God sows clothes for them as they're leaving the garden. And so I think there's such beauty, even in this moment of great pain and the punishment that comes with it, that God is still loving and caring for us, even when we sin, because there's always mercy that God is waiting to lavish upon us. And I also love in, in Eve's story that she is honest about what she's done. And she reminds me every time I read this story that prayer is about honest communication with God. And there's nothing that we need to hide from God. There's nothing we can hide from God. So to think about, you know, in the garden of your own heart, in those intimate places of prayer, especially in this holy week, to think about what might it be that you might be holding back from God? Could you bring that to God in prayer, trusting that there'll be mercy and compassion waiting for you? Because that's just what the Lord is waiting to give to us. So hold that in your thoughts, too, as we go into you know Easter and think about what it means that that Christ came and you know defeated death and conquered sin. What does it mean to carry Eve's story with us? I think that's really powerful too as we enter into the space of Easter Sunday and the Easter season that follows. So finally the last um, theme that we have in our here to book that I want to talk about today is the tomb. And so fitting for today, right? Because Holy Saturday, I always think about those women at the tomb, right? This was the day that they were coming and the reality of the loss of their friend and their leader and their teacher. You know, all they could do was grieve in the ways, those rituals that their society had to come and anoint the body, you know, to take care of the body of their friend. Um, and the women in the Old Testament that I was thinking about with the tomb, um, now, this might be a story that's new to some of you. So this comes from the first chapter of Exodus. Um, and there are these two midwives that are named. Their names are Shifra and Pua. And these midwives have a really powerful part to play in the story of Israel. So just to give you a little background, at the very beginning of the book of Exodus, we hear about how the Egyptians were fearing the Israelites because you know, even though the Egyptians had enslaved the Israelites, the Israelites were really growing in number. And so the Egyptians were just fearful because you know, of the sheer size of the Israelites and how they were growing. So um, in the book of Exodus here, we read that the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other one Pua, he said to them, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew, Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. This is just those couple of verses in the book of Exodus. But every time I read that, I'm blown away to think that these women, these midwives stood up in a very 
cunning and clever and and beautifully life-giving way to this evil king, right? To, to say that, no, they would not carry out this work of evil that the, the king was asking of them. They were unafraid to stand together, to face the reality of death and to defy it. And in some ways, I think they foreshadow in a beautiful way, the women at the tomb, right? Because they are, they're standing together, they're standing in the face of death, they're doing what they can. And I think when you think about the midwives story of what it meant for them to look at, you know, the tomb that their people were facing, the death of all these baby boys, what that would have done to their culture. They, they were in some ways looking right into the tomb of that death and refusing to accept it. And I think they remind us that even when we are facing death, we are never powerless and we can believe in life beyond what we see. And I don't know about you, but if there were ever a time in our lives to say that we can look at death and declare that it doesn't have power over us, that God will triumph over it, right now is a really incredibly prophetic time to think about that call in our lives and how we live into that part of our faith. Because they, those midwives remind us, I think, to trust in God to bring life out of death, to trust that God is at work even when it looks like all the forces are conspiring against us, you know, to set aside fear and to find strength in our faith. That's just an incredible story to draw from right now, I think. And finally, to think about, you know, the strength that's found in women coming together who love and trust in God. I mean, those women at the tomb were the first witnesses to the resurrection, right? They were the ones sent to spread the good news, first and foremost. And if you think about these women, these midwives, they trusted in God. They knew that they could not do this work of death. And, and God loved them and delighted in them. And even it says, you know, rewarded them with families, that that deep love they felt for God was manifested in their own lives. So I love thinking about that connection between those women in Egypt, the Hebrew midwives, and the women at the tomb. You know, we have all these stories of women in scripture who are leading us in powerful ways um, right into these mysteries of, of Easter and what this next season of joy is waiting to bring us. So I know I just gave you like a whole feast of stories from scripture, but in some ways that's what today's about, right? I always think at Easter Vigil with each reading, I'm like, I could sit and think about that for a long time. Nope. Here's another Psalm of praise. Here's another reading. Like this is a day for feasting in stories and delighting in all of these stories of scripture that tell one great story of salvation, right? And I hope that that's what our Lenten journey together brought you to see, you know, that all these stories of scripture, they're not for far away. They're not for some other time and place. They're telling us the same truth about God working in our lives here and now. And that's my prayer for you as we go forth Today, think about how can you surround yourself with good stories today and into this Easter season, right? How can you draw strength from these women of faith in your own life, in scripture, um, to remember like this beautiful gold is singing out to us, right? That God is here too. That no matter where you are in your life, no matter the isolation or the loneliness you're feeling now, no matter that sense that we're all sharing that the world's turned upside down. God is still here. God is working to bring life out of death. That's what we're about to start celebrating tonight. That's the song that's going to ring out tomorrow morning. So to go forth from this place and to say, how do I keep looking for God in my life here too, right? And going forward. So I hope that you'll keep praying with us through the Easter season. Um, one of the other things that I've been able to write through Blessed Issue is this Easter book that's called Risen, 50 Ways to Live Easter. So this book goes through all the resurrection stories in the gospel, reads a little bit of those stories from the gospel each day to just feast on the resurrection. And then I pulled together some reflections on Easter. And one really practical, easy way you can live out the spirit of Easter in your own life. So I think that, you know, as we go through Lent, we come to Holy Week, I always feel like I want something more to carry into Easter to really celebrate 50 full days of Easter. 
And so that's why I wrote this book. You can find it at blessedishe.net. Risen is the name of it. And I hope that you'll join us in praying through the, all those stories of resurrection and all these Easter you know, stories of hope that we're going to have in the lectionary in the coming season. Um, I think all of us right now want those stories of hope and joy and how beautiful to gather in prayer together to celebrate that. So I wish you a beautiful Holy Saturday. I want to pray as we're leaving together today. And um, I just thank all of you for being here. I am so grateful to have spent some of this day with you and to join with you in prayer and reflection. This community is so beautiful across the whole world. We're, we're gathering in prayer together. So if you'll join me in prayer, um, let's give glory to God, even, even here and now where we are today. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of goodness, be with us in our waiting today. Be with us in our hearts that are longing for you, our hearts that are longing for peace and understanding and hope. Draw us close to your side, especially now as we enter into what we want to be a season of joy and hope. God, we ask that you be with each one of us today who has gathered here Send us forth from this place with, with hearts full of light and love and longing for you. Help us to trust that this is a season of grace and surprises and that you are waiting to triumph in our lives and to do a new thing in our hearts and in this world. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, thanks so much for being with me today. This was an absolute gift. Um, I'll be praying for each one of you, and I hope that you will delight in the ways that God is continuing to work in your life and to find you here too. Take care. Bye.